What's up, y'all? This is DJ Kenny Parker, DJ and producer for Boogie Down Productions slash KRS-One, and today I'm back with another story. Today's story is part of my series that I call Epic Fails, When Hip Hop Goes Wrong. And today's topic is the wonderful world of sample clearances. Now, what some of you out there may not know is that the subject of sampling has been one of the most controversial topics in the history of hip hop. Sampling, to put it in simple terms, is basically borrowing music from old records to create a new instrumental for rappers to rap over. Now, before the 1990s, hip hop sampling was basically like the Wild West. When we went into the studio to create a track, we didn't think about whether or not we should use one record versus another record and would we get permission to use this song. We just used whatever song we like, sampled it, and rocked out. Now, every so often, here and there, you would hear about a lawsuit or somebody couldn't clear a song. But for the most part, record companies and rappers didn't care. However, in 1992, everything changed. Like I mentioned in my book, my brother's name is Kenny. If you don't have the book, pick it up. I'll leave a link in the description below. Like I mentioned in the book, <clears throat> me and the rapper Bismarcky were very close friends. Biz Markey sampled a song by a singer named Gilbert O'Sullivan for his 1992 album, I Need a Haircut. This particular singer decided to sue Biz in court for copyright infringement. Biz and Warner Brothers eventually went to court and lost. One time, back in 1992, I was riding around with Biz and we were talking about the case that he had just lost. Do you guys remember back in the day when you used to pop in a video cassette and before the movie start, they had like a little warning, an FBI warning? Biz Markey told me that not only did they want to find him, but they were offering him jail time over this sample clearance case. Wow. Needless to say, after 1992, the hip hop industry changed and all samples had to be cleared. Now, let me talk about my own group, Boogie Down Productions, and my brother, KRS-One, who I call Chris for the sake of this conversation. Just like most hip-hop groups, Boogie Down Productions did a lot of sampling on just about all of the albums that you heard and the KRS-One albums. What you guys might not know is that the Criminal Minded album by Boogie Down Productions is considered the first full-length album to have most of its music derived from sampling. Now, this first story I want to talk about, I have to be vague. So it happened between the years of 1987 and 1993. What I can say is that the particular song that I'm talking about was a single. BDP was scheduled to do a performance in Los Angeles at a nightclub. So we were there early to do the sound check. As we were all in the venue chilling out, waiting to do sound check, in walks this older gentleman. He walks right up to the group and announces his name. Now, most of you guys out there that are DJs or who dig in the crates would know exactly who this guy is as soon as I said his name. When he said his name to us, we all went, wow, that's so-and-so. And we knew that we had sampled his song for one of our singles. So the guy says, KRS, can I talk to you for a second? Chris says, sure. And they go off into a corner to speak. About five minutes later, Chris comes back and the guy leaves. So, of course, I'm like, so what did y'all talk about? Chris says, basically, 
The guy wants money. The guy wants money for BDP sampling his song. And the guy said he didn't want to go through any lawyers. He didn't want to go through any record companies. He just wanted a check. And the check was sizable for a few thousand dollars. My first reaction was, wow, this guy's kind of bold. He came all the way to the sound check and asked for money straight up. So I said to Chris, what are you going to do? And Chris said, I'm going to pay him. He said, the amount of money that I made off of that sample, it's worth it for me to pay this guy and get him out of my hair. So KRS paid the guy under the table and we never heard from him again. This incident was eye-opening for me because it was one of my first real encounters with sampling and the music business. Fast forward to a few months later, BDP once again had a show at the legendary New York City nightclub called SOBs. The show was great, we tore it down, and usually, right after the show, Karis one and the rest of the crew head to the dressing room. But I, being the DJ, usually had to stay behind to pack up the equipment. So right as I'm packing up the equipment, once again, an older gentleman walks up to me. He says, hey, can I speak to you for a second? I said, sure. And the guy introduced himself. I immediately recognized his name as someone that we had sampled. Like a fool, the first words out of my mouth were, Wow, we sampled your song. <laughs> this older gentleman said, Yeah, I know, and I'm starving. I was looking right in this guy's face, and the way he said, I'm starving, it didn't sound like he meant it figuratively. It sounded like he meant, I'm hungry right now. I was kind of stunned by what he said. And I kind of was like, oh, 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 like that. But he was just looking at me dead serious. Keep in mind, this guy has been sampled by dozens of rappers on big songs that you would know. So I said to the guy, hey, man, you need to talk to KRS. It just so happens that our road manager was about 10 feet away from me. And I pointed the guy to the direction of our road manager. And I said, you see that guy? You need to talk to him. Tell him what you told me and see if he can get you to KRS-One. And I left it alone and the guy stepped off. That entire incident was another eye opener. And if you mix that with what happened a few months ago with the other guy asking KRS for money, and it made me realize just how hard some of our great musicians from the past really have it. Most of them don't own any of their music. Most of them signed bad contracts. I'm going to get into the music business and what I've seen with contracts and how ruthless it could be later on. But I just wanted to put that out there for now. Let me give you guys another instance that I saw. The year was 1991, summertime, and I was chilling in a section of New York City called The Village. There's a famous park there called Washington Square Park where a lot of people hang out during the summertime. At any given time, you could see rappers out there, singers, a lot of artists, and a lot of comedians and people doing impromptu shows for people walking by. I happened to be crossing through there on my way to buy some records. I happened to bump into one of my friends out in Washington Square Park, who was one of the most famous hip hop photographers of all time. His name is Ernie. He actually put out a very interesting book that became a bestseller. You guys should check it out. Anyway, I ran into my friend Ernie and he was with another older gentleman and he was very excited. He said, yo, Kenny, check it out. I want to introduce you to my friend. I'm like, sure. He said, back in the 70s, 
this guy was as big as Marvin Gaye. I'm like, as big as Marvin Gaye? Who's this? Ernie said, I want to introduce you to my friend, King Floyd. Now, at the time, that name didn't ring any bells. So I was like, hey, nice to meet you. And I shook his hand. Once again, Ernie said, this guy used to be really big, Kenny. He used to be really big. Like an idiot. I said to this man, really? Do you got any songs I could sample? This guy actually said to me, sure I do, sure I do. Like that, like he was really eager for me to sample some of his music. So I said, great, let's hook up. Where do you live? The guy looked at me and said, well, currently I'm homeless and I'm sleeping out here in the park. Now I'm like, wow. This guy was a big artist back in the 70s. This is 1991, and he's sleeping in Washington Square Park. So I basically just was like, oh, okay, man. And, and I stepped off. I didn't even know what to say after that. I was actually embarrassed. So I headed to the record store and I said, let me look this guy up because I still had no idea who King Floyd was. As it turned out, this guy, King Floyd, had a whole section in the music store dedicated to his music. And he had one of the biggest records of 1970 called Groove Me. This particular song sold one million copies and has been sampled by dozens of rappers. King Floyd also has music that has been sampled by numerous artists from Shaggy to Cypress Hill to the Wu-Tang Clan to LL Cool J. Many times after that, when I was in the Washington Park area, I went in there looking for the guy, but I never saw him again. Unfortunately, King Floyd passed in 2006. Rest in peace, King Floyd. The moral of the story is this. The great comedian Chris Rock once said, People say life is short. No, it's not. Life is long especially when you make the wrong decisions. Now, I don't know what kind of decisions King Floyd made, because obviously I don't know the man. But what I do know is that the way the music business is, you can sell one million records, and a few years later, you could be homeless. And the people who made all the money off your record sales would step over you and not even care. But I'm going to get into that at another time. Finally, here's my last epic fail sample clearance story, and it goes like this. The year was 1999. My good friend, the Grammy Award-winning engineer, who we call Commissioner Gordon, who has worked with Dozens of major acts, including KRS One, invited me to come down to a concert for an artist who he was working with at Madison Square Garden called Lauren Hill. Now, this was around the time when Lauren Hill's album, The Miseducation of Lauren Hill, was at its peak. After the concert, I was chilling at the soundboard with my man, Commissioner Gordon. He said, Kenny, let me introduce you to somebody. And once again, brought over this older gentleman. He introduced the guy to me, and I said, hey, how you doing? The guy says, hey, nice to meet you. I did some work with your brother a few years back. He then said, tell your brother I said, what's up? So he said his name again. 
it didn't ring any bells to me. And I guess the guy could tell that his name didn't really ring any bells to me. And he started saying, yeah, I worked with this person. I worked with that person. And then he said, I worked with the legendary Roy Ayers. He said, I'm the one who was singing Shooby Doo, Run, Run, Run on the classic song Running Away. So now I'm like, oh, really? That's one of my favorite songs. Now he had my attention. Guess what I said next to this man, y'all? I said, do you have any songs of your own? The guy said, yeah, I have a bunch of music. It was almost like he was trying to convince me that he was dope. So I said, what's your name again? He said, tell your brother Edwin Birdsong said, what's up? Guess what I said, y'all? I said, oh, Birdsong. That reminds me of this old basketball player I used to like named Otis Birdsong. He said, yeah, that's my cousin. So I said, oh, okay, I'll remember you through Otis Birdsong. What an idiot. Of course, this was 1998, so there was no Google or internet to look this guy up. So once again, I went to the record store and I looked up Edwin Birdsong. As you guys can probably imagine, they had a whole section of his music. As it turned out, he's another guy who's been sampled dozens of times. And he made one of the most classic breakbeat records, Rapper Dapper Snapper, used by De La Soul in Me, Myself, and I. Another one of his songs was sampled by the pioneering electronic group Daft Punk, who Kanye West sampled to make this number one smash hit, Stronger. Of course, once I realized who this guy was, I felt like an idiot, as I should have. And, unfortunately, Edwin Birdsong passed away, and I never got to see the guy again. Well, guys, there you have it. A few of my epic fail stories when it comes to the world of sampling. Obviously, I'm quite embarrassed by some of these stories, but like I said in earlier posts, I'm going to put it all out there for you guys to see. I want to give a full and complete view of what the music business is really like. If you guys enjoyed the story, please give me a thumbs up and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys on the next one.